welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Happy July. Today I chat with Duran Young. She is the founder, president, and CEO. She's all the things of Black Therapist Rock, and she's the IFS Institute's online ambassador. I have thought a lot about what I wanted to say in this introduction. I think it's important for you to know that we met to record this at the beginning of May. We were still in the mid middle of the COVID shutdown, stay at home orders, and George Floyd was still alive. On the day we met, we decided to wait to have a greater conversation about race and mental health and to do that during July, which is Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. As you probably know, I am terrible about giving my guests bios. I just don't really do it. But I want these podcasts to be light and fun conversations between friends. Um, But I want you, the listener, to feel like you're part of the conversation where you just walk in and have a couple of friends talking about their own parts and talking about what they're passionate about and talking about IFS. So today is no different because Duran and I are friends and we jump in and start talking. So the, the beginning is a little bit kind of awkward because you're jumping into a conversation that that we have already started to have. I edit out some of it because as soon as we get on the call, we just start talking. Duran and I basically talk about her story today and she's vulnerable and lovely and you really hear her. I mean, she really shines through, which I think is every, if you watch anything that she does on Facebook, all the, she does a lot of Facebook lives um, and the webinar with Dick that she does, that's, you know, you just really see her shining through. Um, And so over the next three weeks, what's going to happen is Duran and I are going to meet together with another guest. So today it's just Duran and I, but the next uh, three weeks after that will be Duran and I and another guest. And it's going to be super, super fun. I would love it if you would subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, view, like, share it with your friends, uh, do all the things. And then also you can connect with Duran and I both on Facebook and Instagram. Um, You know, you can connect with me at the One Inside Facebook page and at IFS Tammy on Instagram. And you can connect with Duran at Black Therapist Rock on Instagram and Facebook and Duran Young on Facebook. The link to Duran's favorite books and to her demo with Dick on Legacy Burdens, which is a must-see, and a link to financially support Black Therapist Rock are all on the show notes. So back to the introduction. Some of my parts had a lot of things that they wanted to say about all that's happened over the past couple of months. Um, And so they wanted to give their opinions. But we all decided that I'm actually just going to tell you how Duran and I met, because I think it's a funny story. Okay, so first you need to know that I hate buffets. I hate them. I find them, so this is clearly a part, a part of me speaking, a part of me hates buffets and finds buffets incredibly overwhelming. Uh, There's too much food and there's way too many choices. And there is this um, feeling of like, which part is going to pick? Like, is the part that likes to eat all the food is that part going to pick? Is the part who says like, we need to be really healthy and be eat only whole foods. Is that going to pick? Is the one who's like, we're going to need to be on a diet. And so only pick foods that have really, really low calories. Like which part is going to pick? There's that. Then there's like so many people and they're always usually, it's like slow. And I don't, (laughs) so my, my parts find it just a super awful experience. So there's that. So picture that happening, but I'm at the IFS conference and there are these two long tables and you're in this huge conference room and there's like no windows, there's no like air going on and you can't see outside. And so Duran and I, I know who she is, but we've never met before. And we're both kind of hanging out at the end 
of this lunch line. Like we're both not in the line, but we're just kind of lingering there. And I'm having all these feelings happening inside and all this little parts party happening inside. And we just start talking. And I think she, I think we both were kind of like, are we eating? Are we not eating? Are we going to walk outside? And she was kind of feeling the same way. And I think we both have helper parts. And so I kind of remember thinking, I want to help her relax. Like I don't know if she was speaking later that day or maybe she was speaking in the morning. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll help her get food and that will help her relax. And so if I'm helping her, then that helps me get food. Anyway, I don't know. So we, what I do remember is we end up, I think we end up getting food and we end up sitting together and we just got real and vulnerable and we shared secrets and we had just a really lovely connection. And we've been friends ever since. Um, And she's just, like I said, she's lovely. She's funny. She's fun. And she's real. Um, She's just a really warm, lovely person. And I think um, you're going to love her. And I'm just really, really honored to have her on the podcast. So enjoy. How are you doing with not seeing your son for so long? I miss him. You're going to make me cry? Are we recording? Is that the point? <laughs> but if we can just throw it away. It can, no, we can throw no. it away. I, I'm brave enough. I edit I these cry. things, so <laughs> no, it's don't. Okay. I can cry. You know, I'm, I'm like queen of crying, actually. <laughs> crying and laughing. Laughing at the same time. At the time, same time, know? yeah. Um, I miss him, and he misses me, and it's, it's a big transition, you know? And yeah. uh, I was FaceTiming with him the other day, and I, he wants to come back home. But I'm like, this is what's good for you. So like being a self-led parent sometimes is not like doing what makes your kid happy or doing even what makes yourself happy, a part of you happy, but really doing like looking at the whole situation. And that's something I was thinking about. Like parts only see part of a situation, Mm. you know, like they see the part part. of it. Yeah. Oh my God, that's good. And and I just, it just. Like I've had so many epiphanies while he's gone. Like I said, he's turned into this reading rock star. Mm -hmm. And for a kid with dyslexia, that's like unheard of. Yeah. You know, it's really been magical. I got a video of his dad from his dad. It was like him reading and like not beating himself up, not Mm -hmm. not calling himself stupid, not Mm -hmm. saying I hate school, school is useless, you know. Wow. So really feeling like he's, so I'm like, let's keep, let's keep his learning this way. I told the IEP, like the IEP coordinator, like, I really like what's happening now. And I think we should keep it. That's awesome. That's it's, awesome. But it's still hard, hard for everybody. Yeah. 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 And, and I think you're right though, that, that parts only see parts of a situation. So I think there's parts of me that are like, I would die. I would die. Yeah. And like really selfish. <laughs> like, I don't care. <laughs> Right. Sounds terrible. Right. But like parts of me like, yeah. I don't care. I couldn't, not that you're giving him up, but that's what's coming up for me. Like I couldn't give him up. I couldn't give him up. Like, um, and, that's and I come think up. if we were like, if I was where I am now as a person, like I got married before IFS. Yeah. And yes. yeah. I, we would, you know, we wouldn't fight actually. Mm-hmm. I would just go in the closet and cry. Uh, and I realized that that was a very young part of me that dealt with everything that way in childhood. You know, I would always find myself in the closet crying. And so even in my marriage, that was my coping skill. So I always say if I had IFS then, who knows, you know, but I didn't. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. Well, we I think you're right, though. That's what happens is parts of us, like even now with this COVID thing, parts of me are responding. These young parts are oh. responding as they did with the stuff happening in my family. So that, I think that's part of the eating stuff is that like, oh. it's the only way I could find comfort in my family. And it was also something that was super controlled in my family. Right. So if I could get a bag of cookies, then it went, oh. it all went in because it was, yeah. So that's happening. And I, I did a demo with Dick for the continuity program uh, last week. And that's the other thing. I've been a whole lot more busier than I thought I would be. Um, so I'm like thankful. I'm really thankful that my son is not here. Um, being an online, you know, I, all my work is online. It's been online for like the last two years and I've been always trying to find other people who speak this language. So it's nice that everybody is online right now. Mm. Like we have audience, you know, it's like I get lots of engagement. Um, but everybody wants to do everything. Like all the pot, I did a, um, YouTube interview last night with somebody who runs a, 
She has about 25,000 people in a group for urban travel. Wow. So black and brown folks that travel the world, you know, to a lot of um, kind of uncommon places like India, Asia. Um, mm. So she's been everywhere. She lived in Japan. I lived in Italy. And we were just talking about kind of the isolation and how like some of us when we're living overseas feel that similar isolation. But I also realized like, you know, that I, that sense of isolation is what caused me to create Black Therapist Rock, to, to go online and seek community. Wow. When I was in Italy. And the same thing for her. She was like, I was in Japan. There were no Black or Brown people. <laughs> I mean, there were, you know, Asian people. But right. there's language barriers and she had no family and the sense of touch, like she said, you know, physical touch is her mm-hmm. love language. And she just felt so like disconnected. Mm-hmm. So she created this group and now, you know, it's got her a TED talk. She's been in Essence magazine. Like you just never wow. know where I would say sometimes your purpose comes out of your pain. Wow. And you feel like that's what happened with you with Black Therapist Rock. Oh, absolutely. I was super isolated. And not only that, I was talking about talking to her last night about a lot of vicarious trauma at the time because I was post-divorce. I was new, fresh out of my divorce at the time. And I had a two-year-old and I'm like, I'm in Italy, which is beautiful, but I want to travel. And how the hell am I going to travel with a two-year-old? Yeah. And so part of me was just like very defeated and depressed. But other parts with me were like, no, damn it. My, what some people call my Dora part, Dora the Explorer. I call her Carmen, Carmen San Diego. <laughs> you know? I have those parts that are like, we need culture. We need to see some people that are different from us, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I ended up taking my two-year-old all around the world. I mean, we went to Dubai. We went to China together by ourselves. We got stranded in China. It was crazy. No way. Crazy oh story. Crazy, crazy. Um, you know, he's been to France. He's been all over. So he's very cultured mm-hmm. too. And I used to joke and say, he's a child of the world. <laughs> mm, I love that. Well, and so do you feel like that part is helping you now? Or is that part, like, what's, how is that affecting you now, given you're like yeah. stuck in your, because you're in DC, right? Right. I'm, out, I'm on the outskirts of DC. I'm in Rockville, Maryland. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I think they're helping me because like last night, I feel like all that I've kind of done up till now has really prepared me to provide some inspiration. Like while we're sheltering in love as Tara Brock calls it. I listened to Tara Brock last night because I couldn't sleep. I love it. So she says we're sheltering in love and we just have to stay connected as best way we can. You know, we have mm-hmm. to really, I think I've been practicing my U-turns like crazy because I want to lash out on everybody. You know, yeah. everybody's going down when I'm upset. <laughs> Says a part of me. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Like, I really have to be mindful of like my own self-care, my own mm-hmm. mood. You know, mm-hmm. am I eating well? Am I sleeping? Am I working out? Am I moving enough? But those are things I've been working on for the last two years. Because like I said, you know, since I retired from the military, this has been my life, being in the house, you know, for the most part. Right, so it hasn't been a huge change for you because you've been doing so much stuff online. Yep. One of the things about you, though, that I know is that is that a lot of people want you. I think that you are, because you're the face, you're the name of Black Therapist Rock. I'm not sure how IFS got you, but we're lucky <laughs> that we got you. But I know a lot of people want you. And I was thinking about you this yeah. morning because I thought, I feel like a lot of people are, I'm imagining sometimes it feels like people are just constantly grabbing at you. Yeah. And that's that's why I kind of, I I'm trying to get more structured in my days. That's why I said my son needed to go elsewhere because there's no structure in this house. Mm. The structure is he gets up and goes to school every day. And then I get up shortly after him. (laughs) (laughs) That's the structure. And if he's not going to school, guess who's not getting up? (laughs) Yeah. 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 I'm sure a lot of moms can probably relate to that. I I can totally relate to that. I I don't know if this happens to you, but once I get up, I'm going a hundred miles an hour. So parts of me are like, I have to lay in bed because it's the only rest I get. And that's not totally true, but there's a part that thinks that. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's true to that part. Right. And that's what I'm learning. Like really honor our parts because and acknowledge them and what they need and what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Cause when we don't, you know, and for a lot of black folks, we have it for so many years, Yeah, you know, our average a score for the black community is four. Like like you're lucky if you have a four, I myself have a nine, you know, so, so many of us are going through poverty and trauma and, you know, emotional abuse, emotional neglect because our parents, parents were not allowed to have emotions. You know, Mm -hmm. during Jim Crow, during slavery, your child could be sold off to another master and you, 
you didn't really have time to cry about it. I have to tell you, you put up a picture, I don't, this might've been months ago, but it sticks with me of a uh, white woman. No, it was a black woman. It was a black woman and yeah, a white woman yeah. and, and a black baby and a white baby. And the, it was the black baby, I think by itself crying. And the white woman was sort of sitting up in bed and the black woman was breastfeeding the white baby. And I yeah. just, I can't, that picture as a mom just breaks my heart. Yeah. Mine too. And I think about like the generational trauma that stems from that, you know? Yeah, yeah. So the way that Black Therapist Rock Guy started was kind of that way. Like I was going through divorce recovery. I was a therapist in Italy and we didn't have therapists off base that spoke English. So we were kind of it Wow. Um, for the military. And I was like working with pilots that were, you know, dropping bombs in places like in mm-hmm. Turkey at the time and working with a lot of um, air traffic controllers and people that were seeing a lot of trauma. Mm-hmm. And then I was also trying to stay online to stay connected to my own kind of, my own culture or what's happening, you know, to my community. Yeah. And yeah. they had the, the Baltimore uprising. We had the, oh the, like the controversy over the, um, the flag, the Confederate flag. Like if it should come down or not, there was a lot of drama about that. Um, Trayvon Martin, everything was just like really speaking to me. And because I was away, the only thing I could really do, I felt like was worry. And I Mm. thought, you know, okay, I have my son and I'm kind of getting to the place where I'm going to retire from the military. And I have no idea where I would want to live because the truth was I felt safer in Africa in China in Italy, way more safer than I ever felt in America. For my son, you know, for this little black boy who will one day be a black man. Somebody has to do something for the black community to help us heal from these collective traumas. And I was like, I wonder why, like, the, you know, I'm not going to name names, but I was just wondering why so many organizations weren't looking at the psychological impact. And I was like, well, that's kind of what therapists do. Like, they're not therapists. Like, they're, you know, there's the legal aspect of trauma and, you know, um, equity and equality, but there's a psychological impact. Mm -hmm. And so I said, maybe if I got some therapists together, like, and also I needed a place to talk about it because the person who's currently the face of this country was running for office and all the Italians were in, you know, I was in London one time. They're looking at me like you Americans are batshit crazy. First of all, (laughs) I was like, I'm not there. I'm here. (laughs) That wasn't a good enough cop out because I was going to have to come back. (laughs) Right. You're like, I'm trying to unblend from that as much <laughs> from as I possibly all of can. That. Yeah. 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 Um, but I really had to like, you know, acknowledge and accept that this is the reality of what it means to live in, you know, live in America as a black person. Mm. So I had a lot of vicarious trauma because a lot of the folks in the military were very supportive of him, actually. And, you know, we're being told you're not allowed to say anything. You can't, you know, you can't speak your mind. And there were so many things that happened in like a five-year time span that I was like, if I don't have a place to get it out, I'm going to fall apart. Like I was burning out. At the same time, I had thyroid disorder and my thyroid was to the point where it had grown, where it was wrapped around my neck and was down like a little string down to my heart. And, you know, the thyroid is only supposed to be like right here. So I had to have like urgent surgery. It's not surgery. supposed to go down to your heart. It's not supposed to be in your heart, people. <laughs> That's trauma. That's what that is. You know, there's a very uh, close correlation between trauma and thyroid disorder, actually. Because wow. your adrenaline is always pumping and your hormones, are, you know, if you're always on fight or flight, your body is constantly responding to the threat. Right. Right. And I know nothing about this, but just what came up to my mind is also like throat chakra, which I know nothing about at all. But I thought about that like voice, not having a voice. That's what a lot of people told me. Like it's cutting off your voice and trying to, you know, make you into. So I was like really struggling with that and still seeing clients, you know, still trying to keep it all together. And as you do as a black woman, right? You don't. mm -hmm, Right. What do you do? You figure it out. You know, it's like single mom. So what? In the military, yeah. you know, it's definitely not the place to <laughs> seek mm. compassion or. <laughs> right. So the mission goes on, as we say in the military. So um, I had to have urgent surgery all alone by myself in the UK with a three week notice. And I think that was a turning point for me. I read The Alchemist um, because mm. I actually woke up in surgery. So I, I did, like, I always ship my son off to his dad when I think some, 
something really bad might happen. Because <laughs> he's more of like a, I don't know, the type A, you know, keeping things together kind of guy. Okay. You know? Okay. Uh, so I shipped him to his dad and I remember coming back thinking, and I remember waking up from surgery and being upset that I was still alive. That's, that's the God honest truth. You know, most people don't want to hear that. They're like, no, Duran, tell us you didn't go that, that far down. It happens. It's real, you yeah, know? And that's, yeah. that's what I try to tell people. Like you can't, things don't just go away. When you have all these negative experiences or traumatic experiences and, and painful things happening to you kind of year by year, they start to collect and add up. Yeah. And there's only so much that the human body can take. You know, we have to, our parts are literally begging for help. I feel like mm. that's your body's way of trying to get your attention. Yeah. And so that was my body's way of saying, you've been in the military for 18 years you know, you've been, you, you were married. Now you're going through this divorce. There's so many changes on top of that. You've, you know, endured sexual abuse, physical abuse, all the abuses as a child, poverty, hunger, starvation, all the things. And it was like, I came into the military and my intention was just to walk away from all of that, but it came into the military with me. You know, that's what I, I had to realize. So yeah. I read the alchemist, um, during my recovery, and I had already started Black Therapist Rock, but I said, you know, I really think that I need to leave the military. They were saying, you know, like I had to recover in two weeks. I had to get back to seeing clients in two weeks after having my complete thyroid taken out. Oh and gosh. folks who had thyroid surgery know that you, your, your hormones go way down. It's kind of like after pregnancy. Mm. You know, you, you've experienced that, like that mm-hmm. crash. And it's like you're crying and you don't know why you're crying. And you're like, why is everything so hard? You know, everything yeah. got 10 times harder energy wise, uh, hormone, like I said, just mood wise. I, that was the se- most severe depression I'd ever had in my life. So I knew like, this is chemical. This yeah. is, you know, my body doing what it's probably needed to do for a very long time, slowing down. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, of course it wasn't a very popular opinion that I said, I need to get out of the military and just go be a mom. And I had a big fight, you know, it was a, a really hard um, thing to, ha- to make happen. But I realized I, it was worth the fight and I needed to do it. So mm-hmm. I got out and I'm so thankful. I mean, I was so scared at the time. I was like, how the hell are you going to feed your kid? You just mm-hmm. bought a house. Like, how are you going to do this? Um, on my way out, I bought a house. Like, that just seemed like the thing to do. <laughs> but also on my way out, I got to engage in this intensive Daytime, it's called a, a trauma day treatment program. And it's IFS based actually here in DC. Mm-hmm. And what happens is you go four days a week from 10 to three or nine to three. And in the morning we speak for our parts. Like we sit in a circle and it's mainly sexual abuse survivors, women who are lawyers and doctors and, wow. you know, really wow. high level, high functioning folks. Sure, there's probably a lot of high functioning folks listening to this. And I used to hate when people would say high functioning because I'm like, if I'm so damn high functioning, why does it feel like I have none of my shit together? Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm constantly trying to just get to the next thing or, you know. Yeah. Just yeah. Keep Don't you think myself that's part of your that's part of your legacy burden too, is a black yeah. woman from the South is like you right. gotta keep functioning, you gotta look like right. you got your stuff together, even if right. you were falling apart. Well, it's that be strong part. And I don't know, I'm going to, hopefully we can plug the demo that I did with Dick um, because that, I mean, it's lifted. So like I recently unburdened my self-esteem part. That was like myself in the toilet um, and a girl from Rakina Barnes helped me do that. And I'm telling you, it's been such a game changer. Like right, I'm so asking I'm for what I need. So, okay, yeah. so you just said two things. One yeah. is the web. So the webinar with Dick, the web- webinar with Dick, people yes. can find that on uh, the IFS Institute Facebook page and the IFS Institute um, on YouTube. Yes. And Duran did um, a webinar with Dick and she did an amazing, amazing mm-hmm. demo. So there's that. And then there's this other piece about um, unburdening self-esteem. your self-esteem part. So can we... Right. Can we talk Back about, up, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what does that even mean? I want to hear about that. So literally, one of my girlfriends is going through the certification program. Shout out to Rakina. Um, I call her my hey, boo. Girl. Like, we've got, hey, girl. Hey, hey we've girl, hey. We've gotten so close. Uh, we talk about our parts almost every day. She's an IFS therapist. 
That's awesome. Um, and she's on the board of Black Therapist Rock. So she, her and I have just gotten so intimate with our parts, like just talking, getting real about real shit, you know, like mm. our childhood, our relationships, because we both kind of attract you know, not the best relationships for the women that we are. I'm like, we're badass women. We deserve badass men yeah, <laughs> <You know? yes. laughs> like, who are going to do the work with us because we're doing the work. Like, yeah, it's right, hard to face right. your trauma when you have so much. Yeah. And I understand why we have a legacy in the Black community of just like avoiding it. It's hard. Yeah, right. So like um, the self-esteem part, we kind of uncover when we're talking and we're like, why do I have this urge to like do whatever people tell me or this people pleasing part? Like what's underneath that? You know, we just kind of get really curious about each other's parts. And then we encourage each other to do U-turns when we're like, they shouldn't do this. They're the worst person on earth. (laughs) So we have really real conversations. And um, so we, we did the self-esteem work while I was dropping my son off in Colorado, literally the next day. And I remember I told her I went outside and I felt like I could take on the world. Like I felt so capable of ever and so worthy of everything that I wanted. So will you tell us about that little, was it a little girl that? Yeah, was it was just... a little girl who, because she was dark skinned, you know, she grew, she grew up getting picked on a lot and she would look at her own picture and just be like, you don't look like everybody else. You're ugly. And I was still, that part was still like, look at my refrigerator and look like, look at pictures of me and my sister and be like, you're the ugly one. She Like your youngest sister is a cute one. You're the smart one. You know, and I think because of patriarchy, a lot of women and a lot of people of color have had to decide, like, am I going to be the cute one or am I going to be the smart one? And why is that more in women of color? Well, because we don't get to be all the things like, you know, we, we are restricted. We're told like, you have to be twice as good as the white folks, you know, but you're only twice as good as the white folks. So it's, it's a polarization that's like, I'm trying to work extra hard to be good enough, right. but I'm never going to really feel good enough because society says I'm not. Right, right. Wow. So it was a huge part for me. Huge, huge, huge. Um, and I keep telling her, like, you totally changed my life because now I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to ask for what I need and want. <laughs> Mm. Like, why wouldn't I? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I love that. So where is that little girl now? Where did she where did she end up? So it's funny you ask, because uh right after we did that unburdening, I was in Denver, Colorado, downtown Denver, Colorado, in the mid- middle of this pandemic. Oh and <laughs> it's like a ghost town down there. It was uh, so funny compared to the IFS conference. You know how we were, I felt like I was just there and it was crowded. Yeah, yeah. And it was literally ghost. And so I'm like, okay, now I'm kid free. Cause I was just like in operation mode, like operation, get, get rid of the kid. Cause yeah. you can't work <laughs> and give him every, like, I'm very intense when it comes to being a mom. I'm very like, engage. I want to engage him and talk to him and have all these conversations and love on him and cuddle and, you know, meals. And I was like, that's going to be a lot while you're trying to work and he's going to be here all the time. Yeah. And he's also yeah. not very, he's not an indoor kid. I'm like, he has to get out. Yeah. And I'm like going to be trying to get out and stay in and work. And, and yeah. so I was just like, that's overwhelming. Yeah. So you need to be like three people, like not just right. two people, like you need like three. Right. Yeah. Or you need a wife. So, a wife. <laughs> That's what I said. A good yeah. one, yeah, right? A good wife, yeah. <laughs> so I, I was in Denver. Yeah, I was in Denver in this Marriott. I'm a Marriott girl. And um, I went downstairs and they're like giving away groceries. Oh and gosh. I mean, I'm like, I'm kind of in denial about the whole pandemic thing still. Yeah. Um, and so I called Rakina and she's like, well, what are you going to do next? And I was like, I don't know. I think I might stay here and enjoy Colorado a few days. I was like, it's great because there's no crowds, you know, like I can be distant and still be in nature. So I went to the mountains. I took my little girl to the mountains and like saw her, all the beautiful things in the world. Just, I was like, you got to see like you're as beautiful as the mountains. And then this is going to sound crazy, but I was like trying to figure out how are we going to get back to Maryland because I was afraid that all the airports would close actually. I don't want to get stuck in that. So I was like, we're going to spend like two or three days in Colorado. Then we got to figure out what's next. And so Rakina kept calling me every day because she was kind of worried. She has this worried mom part that she lends me because <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I'm like caution to the wind. Um, 
And so I was like, okay, now what, you know? And I looked online to look at flights to Maryland. Of course, they're all like 15. That was the other really helpful thing. And getting my son to Colorado, it cost us $15. That's so I was like, oh, that's $15. a, a no-brainer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like no wow. Point. Oh, my gosh. So I'm asking my little girl, who now feels like she can do anything, and I'm like, what do we want to do? And that's the question that I ask myself every single morning now. What do we want to do? Wow. Not what do I have to do, yeah. but what do I really want to do? Yeah. So she wanted to rent a car. No, she wanted to fly to Florida and then rent a car and drive from Florida to Maryland, which is about 16 hours. Now she's done this before after my level one and it made her extremely happy. She just loves to see all the beaches. She loves the beach like my son. So I was like, I'm going to the beach. We're leaving the mountains and I'm going to the beach. And I did that. And it felt so good just to like listen to audio books and be with myself and stop wherever I felt. I shared a little bit with my Facebook audience. It just felt good to like just be in the flow of, you know, no time crunch, no demands, no kid. Like I'm hungry. <laughs> like, yeah, I got to go to the bathroom. I really, <laughs> I really needed that time with myself. That's amazing. Well, and it really deepens that connection with that, like, because that almost becomes a habit of like waking up and saying, what do I want to do today? And it deepens that relationship with that little girl. Right. Because then you get to do that every day. Do we want to stop here? Do we want to stop here? What do we want to do? Right. I love that. So what beach it was did you go perfect. to in Florida? I, well, I didn't really get to go to any because, I mean, not many because there were a lot of people and I was like, ah, people. <laughs> yeah. Know? That first like week or two, right? Everyone. That. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I got out of yeah. Miami like as soon as possible. I was like, we got to definitely get out of here because it was so crowded. Everybody was outside. I went to a place about two hours. I don't even know. I have to look at my phone. Two hours north of maybe an hour and a half. But it was like a little resort. No one was there. They had their own private beach. And that was perfect. Oh Perfect. I'm trying to, it was like a little town. I don't even remember. If I look at my Marriott account, I could tell you, but super small, great place to have like a level one training or mm. some type of training retreat. Such a great place. Love it. it was so quiet and I love quiet. I'm a country girl, so I love the quiet. That little girl has been told her whole life, and that was also what was happening in the military And when you decided to retire. That's why it's almost so amazing that you actually were like, I have to I retire, and you, and you pushed know. through, and you didn't let everyone else tell you that, because I'm sure that little girl was like, no, 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 oh, no. Oh, listen, Tammy, they were, they were like, we're going to come after your license, because you have a duty to your client, your patients. And your paperwork, you can't just drop, you know, paperwork in the middle. You're going to have incomplete files and da, 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 da. And I was like on the phone with lawyers. I mean, it was real. It sounds ugly. The military runs on fear. You know, it's like you have no time to even think about any of your parts because they're all dictated to you. Mm, Wow. So 18 years of childhood and then 18 years in the military. And it's like, okay, I want to get to who I am, who, what I really want for right. myself. When it sounds like trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. Yeah. And, and then I also decided that I didn't want to see clients like, you know, working with such intense trauma in the military because you're working with folks who are either, you know, killing people for a living, to be honest, yeah. or their spouses who are super stressed out because their spouse is always gone and, and killing people for a living. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a high intensity work environment when you're doing therapy in the military. And I realized like, I just needed a break. Like, just like I realized I needed a break from motherhood or I was, I was going to drive myself crazy, try to do everything. Mm-hmm. You have to know, I had to realize like, I can't do everything. I'm going to break. Mm. You know? So you ended up in DC. What made you decide to go there? <laughs> it's funny you ask. It, I mean, everything is just such a fluke. It, it, it is, but it's not. You know, like when you yeah. really have those conversations with yourself and and really like go out on what you want, yeah. you're rarely disappointed. For me anyway, I'm rarely disappointed. So I told them, they're like, well, where are you going to go? And uh, the way I ended up in D.C. was a, I said, I need at least some time to like sit with the therapist of my own and get my own mental health together. Mm. Um, and so I c- called myself an impaired provider, which most people are deathly afraid of. Like, ah, you're going to be an impaired provider. Do you know what that means? It no. means like 
and I wish more therapists really understood this concept. Cause when I understood, like, I was like, I don't know what this is, but I can be no one's therapist if my own mental health is falling, you know, if I'm failing in my own mental health, mm. like how good am I going to be to my patients, to my clients, if I'm falling apart. Right. Right. So an impaired provider, usually people think of it with alcohol. Like if a therapist has an issue with alcohol and they really want you to come forward and ask for help before you're jeopardizing other people's health and their lives, you know? Okay. Um, so I said, I, this is the most depressed I've ever been in my life. I don't think it's safe for me to be with my patients who may be suicidal, who may be, you know, I'm going to miss something. Like my energy, I was falling asleep throughout the day. Mm. I was like needing to recover. Yeah. And I knew that I was not safe as anyone's therapist. It wasn't a good idea. Um, and so I had to be labeled as an impaired provider. Um, and then I, for an impaired provider in mental health in the military, it means that, and then you're overseas, like if you're in another country, it means they have to fly you to a different country for treatment. So okay, my options okay. were this lush place in the UK that everybody calls it like summer camp. You go and you have your own room and the grounds are beautiful. And you take walks every day and you meditate. I was like, uh-uh, we got trauma. Like we, <laughs> we got some work to do. That's yeah. not going to cut it. You know, yeah, right. the military, of course, we're really good um, at putting band-aids on things. Like even us as therapists in the military, oftentimes it's get them back to work. That's the goal. Not, and, and I had my supervisor tell me that. Like, cause I was like, I don't know that I can help people right now. He said, like, your goal is not to make their lives better. Your goal is just to get them well enough to go back to work. And I was just like, huh? You're a social worker. And you just said that to me out loud. I was like, I'm done with all of this. Wow. So I told them to send me a uh, stateside and they were thinking, okay, she'll be back in four weeks. Like they put me on this four week plan to go and get my shit together and come back. Do and your job. Like, yeah. There's too come much back shit. And do your job. Yeah. <laughs> This is the stuff that needs to be really dealt with, you know? Yeah. So I then asked to go to a more intensive program. That's when they sent me to the IFS based program in DC. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and here you are. Yeah. And then when did you do your level one after that? It's so funny. That's what I mean. Like, I think I'm like so thankful to myself. I'm like, shout out to my parts and shout out to myself. Um, I went through this program and was like, I've been trained in every trauma model there is. Being a military therapist, I've been trained in CPT, which I actually loved at the time, um, DBT, you know, so cognitive processing therapy, EMDR. Um, we were also doing uh, the one that most people hate now, and I do too, prolonged exposure. Oh, gosh. Eek. I did prolonged exposure with a rape victim, and I've, I still feel guilty about that. Parts mm. of me are really like, oh, that was bad. Mm. Um, but the military is big on trauma training, so I'm like, how come I didn't know about this IFS stuff? Like, this mm. literally has changed my life. It was hard. I mean, I would cry every day. A lot of my firefighters had to come and take me out, like a lot of drinking on the way home, mm. you know, because uh, I didn't have my son then either. I knew, like, I needed to really focus on myself. So I did all that work. And at the end, I asked my, um, my case manager, I was like, what model are you guys using? Because we're not using this in the military. And I think we should. Yeah. Like, why does it take someone breaking and having to re force retirement, forced early retirement after a sexual assault that I didn't talk about? Right. Like it only came out in that setting. Um, so, wow. so many things were like coming out that I never would have talked about, never would have dealt with. And I'm this is what we need. Yeah. And then, so I asked like, what is this model? Who, who created it? Where do I find out more? And then I wrote down Dick Schwartz IFS. And I was like off on the YouTube, you know, rabbit, rabbit hole. Um, I fell in love with it on YouTube. I fell in love with what it did for my life. And I reached out to John and I was like, more of us black folks need this. How do we make this happen? And he was like, we would love to make that happen because <laughs> we haven't had, we haven't been able to make that happen for some yeah. reason. Yeah. And we have yeah. wanted to for years. Yeah. So it was yeah. like, that's what I mean. When you're in that self energy and you're leading yourself, you know, yourself is leading your life. Yeah. So many good things can happen. And it's scary because you don't know. You're like, well, this is what we know. Parts is what I know. Yeah. But yeah. self is just so much more powerful, so much more forward thinking, vision, visionary, you know, so much more. Mm -hmm. Uh, a purposeful life. Mm. 
Mm, I'm feeling that as you're talking, I'm like, yeah, it does feel good. Because I think right now with this COVID stuff, it's like my parts are so run. I think a lot of us, our parts are just running our lives because it's what we've known for so long. And so it's like what we just go back into because it's like, let's go back into the stuff that, that used to work. And I've been telling people, some of that is, but some of that is what we need to do. You know, when I was doing all that intensive work, like I said, I would literally stop by the bar on the way home during happy hour or walk. You know, a lot of times I would just walk to the nearest bar, have a couple of drinks and walk home. Sometimes we have to do what our, mm. what our system needs for us to do in that moment. Yeah. And that's, to me, that's what self-care lo- is really about is saying, what do I need? And sometimes it's, I need to, I need to let one of my firefighters step in until I can know how to do something else. Yeah. Well, I love that. I just heard this. I don't remember where I heard it, but about giving compassion. Like right now, I think what's happening for me right now is I'm talking about it as parts of me are so frustrated with my firefighter behavior Mm -hmm. instead of giving compassion to my firefighter behavior, like instead of giving compassion to those parts. And then that's when self will be there. And that will feel so much better is to give compassion to those firefighters. They're trying to help. Exactly. I was listening to your episode with Mike Elkin on shame. And I think that's so true what he was saying about like, we're trying not to be bad. And so I've been like, when I was on my drive, I was leaning into all the parts of me that felt bad. I think it was that self-esteem part. Once that part was like, we are so good. It's like, why did we ever think we were bad? You know, it's like, you're bad because you are divorced. You're bad. You know, all those shadow things that we our society tells us we're supposed to feel bad about. Yeah. Um, I think they get tucked away in our unconscious and we don't even realize it's there. I love that. I love that. And right. Cause it's when the self-esteem part, when she was able to be unburdened, that actually kind of moved her out of the way. And then all of a sudden there are all these, like you said, shadow parts that we don't even realize are there and that you were courage, courageous enough to lean into them. When I usually mean, I, we're like, I don't want to look at that, right? I don't want to look at that. Course. I don't want. I don't want to look at my badness. Right. Um, but I, I just see it as like there's so much goodness on oh, on top of that, you know. Yeah, like when you yeah. can really look at all those things and embrace all those things, and it's where our humanity is. That's what I'm realizing. Like, mm. I, I said to myself yesterday, I just was trying so many years not to be human. Mm. Well, I think that's what was taught to you. That was taught to how, how you were supposed to survive. How are you managing all of the, the high expectations on you as who you're supposed to be or what, like, even now, all of these people <laughs> want a piece of you, but they're also the sort of this, like, how you're supposed to be. How are you doing with that? Right. You know, when you become yeah. such a big leader like you are, there's yeah. probably a lot of pressure. Well, I, I'll shout out to one of my good friends. I can call her a friend now. I can't believe I can call her a friend. Brene Brown has been such a good influence on me and in that like with the gifts of imperfection, like really over the last two years, I've also been working with her a lot. Mm-hmm. And the way she embraces her flaws, and she's so damn funny about it. Like she's just like, when you're on a meeting with her, she's just like, here I am. This is what I do. <laughs> like, And I'm that way. Mm. So it just allowed me to be whoever I am that day. Like, mm. I don't have to show up and be perfect. I don't have to show up and be anything but who I am. In, in that day or in that moment, right? I don't have to be like, this is who I am. That's who I have to stay. And then, oh. yeah, whoever I am in that moment. Mm. It's real. So she has a book called Dare to Lead that I would highly recommend. And folks, I I know right now I'm reading a ton of books um, while I'm walking and, you know, in nature, listening to audio books. And so Dare to Lead is a really good book that I've been referring back to. Another really good book that I plugged yesterday is You're a Badass at Making Money. Mm -hmm. Because money is such a sensitive topic right now. And we're like, we don't know if it's going to be there. It feels very scarce resources yeah. and even yeah. toilet paper, right? Right, now, right, know? right. The chicken. I'm like, where the hell is all the chicken gone? <laughs> like I went to the grocery store and the chicken aisle, there's like three packs of drumsticks left. And I'm like, really? Wow. Is this it's what we're so doing weird. now? <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. Like when we, I went once, I think I've only been once in weeks. Oh, wow. It's, it's crazy. Well, my husband wow. goes, so he he's the... You know what? I like going. I'm like, I have to get out of here. I know. He likes going. Mm. I have been doing a lot of uh, Amazon shopping. But yeah, there was like, it's weird the things that are missing or the the things that aren't there. Like there's no pancake mix. Like there's no pancake mix. Like that's so weird. Yeah. Vinegar too. The other day we were looking for vinegar and we had to go to like three different stores to find vinegar. How weird is that? (laughs) 
just random. It's so random. Okay, I like this question you asked me. If I wasn't a therapist practitioner doing IFS work in the world, what would you be doing? Have fun with this. I have fun with everything. <laughs> I'm yeah. still growing up. That's what I tell people because I didn't have a childhood. I was the oldest of three. My mother, you know, crack cocaine. It was a hard, hard childhood. And I'm just getting to the point where I can say that. Mm. When I was in this intensive program, um, my therapist at the time said to me, she had put into her notes that I endured severe neglect. And I was like, I don't know about severe. And she was like, your sister has a third degree burn on her hand from someone forcing you to put your hand on the stove. You know, you've had like just all kinds of torture and abusive situations because your mom wasn't there. She kind of put us wherever she could, wherever she thought we might be safe, but we weren't mm-hmm. always safe, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and so it, it was severe neglect. And I had to admit to myself that I really didn't have a childhood. I was a second mom. Yeah. You know, How, so what older, were the ages of your, of your siblings? And so, I, so for example, I remember the first time my mother left us at home by ourselves, I was four years old and she was going out to the nightclub and, and I still have a lot of abandonment and I'm working on these, these, these are the parts that I'm really feeling compelled to work on right now. Um, abandonment, rejection, anytime and saying goodbye, like people leaving, right? Mm-hmm. Because she, when she left out of that door at four years old at night, it was like midnight, I remember, um, because you remember the TV would stop. There would be no TV after a certain time. And I was like, what are we going to do? We can't even watch TV. But I just always, a part of me believes that when someone walks out of a door, they may die. Wow. And I thought about it as a four-year-old, your mother's leaving you. Of course you're going to panic and think, what if she doesn't come back? Right. And that was always a fear. What if she doesn't come back? What if she doesn't come back? Um, But I was four at that time. My sister um, is exactly a year younger than me, a year and some, some days. So my birthday is August 5th. Her birthday is August 28th. So that means she was three and I have a younger sister who's about two, two and a half years younger than me. I'm like, she was like two. Unbelievable. And so that just gives you a snapshot of the kind of trauma I faced throughout any on the parts that had to like muster up strength and courage to do something to like, even appease my sisters, you know, like keep them calm and, 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 and not be, be afraid leader. parts of you that weren't right. allowed to be afraid. Oh, I, was, fear. I was so afraid. I remember being terrified that night. And I remember her saying, lock the door and don't let anybody in. And I thought, what if somebody tries to come in? So I also have parts that feel like someone's going to break into my house at any moment. Mm-hmm. And I just put that together with, while we're talking right now. Like wow. maybe that's why, you know, I always have this, yeah. like, what if somebody breaks in? What if somebody breaks in? No matter how safe I am, no matter like what neighborhood I live in, I always feel like someone right. could break in. Right, because yeah. your mom said that. And also developmentally, right, at four years right. old, when someone's right. not there, then they're not there. So right. they could always not be there. Right. Mm. So what I would be doing if I wasn't like the leader of Black Therapist Rock is I, I would be doing what I'm doing. I'm working on my parts full time. That's what I tell people. Mm. My job now is to heal all my parts so that I can go out and show other folks how to do it or mm. encourage other, other folks to know that it's possible. You know, when I'm living my best happy life, it's not that I'm boasting or bragging. I want all of us to live this life. Like yeah. I want so many people to be self-led that the world is a better place. Yeah. Do you yeah. have a practice, a daily practice, or just, it sounds like as you go, you're just constantly it's ongoing, talking to you. It's ongoing. I feel like I have so many parts. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, my parts are, <sighs> you know, and that I'm just glad that they're talking to me and we're like getting yeah. somewhere, you know, there's yeah. a relationship. It's, it's been great now that we have a relationship. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think, I don't know if this happens for you, but I think as a mom, when I'm not around mm-hmm. my son, I can be, I can connect more with my parts right. because I think when, it's almost like, you know, if you're around your son, you always have like an ear out, like a mom's ear, your mom's parts always up. Like, so then when you're not around your son, I almost wonder if like, that's not there as much so that you well, can I think really that, drop Well, I think that, I hate to say this, but because I'm raising a black boy, I've had a lot of parts that I've had to work around with being his mom, mm-hmm. you know? So he's activated a lot of my parts that I didn't realize I had as a kid, you know, wanting, like when he came home and said, I wish I was white like everybody else. Yeah. I mean, your mom parts are wanting to say, that shit should never happen. Take him out of the school. Everybody's horrible. And I had to say, myself had to step in and say, this is our reality. 
Mm. And the best way you can be his mom is to be self-led when he's hurting. Well, is it as a woman that it's, uh, I'm raising a black man? I, I was raising, I've raised a little girl, like you had sisters. Right. So is right. it a part about like the parts of you that have some opinions or thoughts about black men? Oh, absolutely. My father was incarcerated my whole entire life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, if you look at the statistics, most of the, the percentage wise, black men make up a lot of the criminal justice system. Um, and I'm seeing, like I said, I've been seeing that so much. And I'm thinking, like, what can we do about this? And I think what we can do is allow black boys to be seen. They're not seen. Mm-hmm. They go to school and they feel like it's all about either trying to be like the girls, trying to be like the white folks. You don't get to be yourself. You don't get to jump around. You know, I let him jump around at home because he's got a lot of energy. But you don't get to, like, say the things that you're really thinking. You have to filter everything. And that's why I say I spent most of my life trying not to be human. Like, don't think that. Don't feel that. You know, like, really trying to shove everything down. So the best thing I can do as his mother is to allow him to fully express all of his parts while he's still young. Because the world is not expecting that from him. Well, because as a little guy, I mean, it was, was it last year when he came home with that? I remember I was talking about that. Yeah, that's crazy, right? So here he's learning that so young. He's learning that so young. And so you're like, in my home, we're not going to teach that. You're not going to learn that. You're going to be able to be your full self with all your parts. Well, and that was, even that message would be from a part. So what I realized is in this Mm. home, you get to talk about everything. Mm. You get to, you know, like someone was laughing because he's like, Sometimes I like to say curse words. And I was like, oh, really? What do you like about them? And he was like, we're like, which ones do you like? He's like, all of them. (laughs) And I'm like, no, part of me when I was a kid liked to say curse words. And like, it was kind of funny, you know? But in this home, everything's safe. Like, you can can be safe here. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, out in the world, you may not feel that way. But you need at least one place and one person. Yeah. You know, and unfortunately, black women and black men, we haven't been able to be that for each other because Mm. during slavery, we couldn't be there. Like we didn't know if we were going to have each other. And a lot of times we were kind of pinned against each other. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's felt like there's a scarcity of resources and we have to fight each other for them. And, you know, like the black man, I think is, is the, the least resourced human in our country right now. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I have a lot of, uh, you know, activist parts around that and I also have a lot of mom parts that I have to constantly be aware of yeah yeah right but the the best thing I can do for him is to be available emotionally you know what I mean to free up Mm -hmm. my own space I didn't grow up with a father so I have a lot of parts that are like you know what's do you really need a father what's it mean you know what what is the purpose of having a man in your life like I have a lot of parts around the absence of a father and what that means to me as a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling really good. It it feels better to say these things, you know, more and more. Um, Like I said, as I heal those parts, I've just been wounded so long and just, they needed me, you know? Yeah. Mm. I feel like when I give them words and I speak to to it, it's healing. It's very therapeutic. Yeah. You're saying things that aren't, aren't weren't allowed to be said exactly and and there's always a little part of me that's like are you sure that's okay to say here you know even my sister she's like oh I can't believe you said that like it's talking about racism we're from Texas nobody talks about racism in Texas it's just and then it's Texas is swimming in racism but you just you completely ignore it right right well because it's um it's such a part of the culture. It's the norm. Yeah, like, yeah. Why are you? It's like, why are you complaining? Why are you? It's not that bad. It's not bad as you're making it out to be. You know, it's like wow. just the way things are. It's not as bad as it used to be. You know, all of that oh, wow. kind of rhetoric. It's, yeah. it's gross. <laughs> it's really wow. Gross. If I weren't doing what I was doing, I'd be, probably be doing another version of what I'm doing because I just want to live the rest of my days having fun enjoying myself you know are you reading anything fun you're reading well i'm reading cool. the the two books that i mentioned but right now i'm i'm reading uh more seriously i'm reading the you're a badass at making money because yeah. i also realized that a lot of us have a, a lot of parts around money yeah. and especially therapists so if you're reading this and you're watching this and or listening to this and you're a therapist i highly 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 recommend this book um there's another book that i would highly recommend there's so many books i mean i read books like that's my thing 
That's what saved me as a child. Mm, like I would wow. escape with the books and writing. Um, so the, you're a badass at making money. And then there's another book called The Cognitive Framework for Understanding Poverty. A Cognitive mm-hmm. Framework for Understanding Poverty by Ruby Payne. Okay. And what I love about both of those books is it shows us how materialism and capitalism kind of instills parts in all of us. And especially if you grew up in poverty, like you, you feel so unworthy of abundance or wow. success. And, you know, you and I have talked about that when I was supposed to go to Facebook and, oh, yeah. you know, it was just like, every time I went to Facebook, it's like the four year old part of me that grew up in the projects is like, how the hell did we get here? And, and how do we, how do, what do we do now that we're here? You know? I remember we were talking about it and you were like, I, you had to get out of it. I'm like, are you crazy? Like, I gotta get out of that meeting. I gotta get out of my Facebook meeting. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it was a lot too. And then, like I said, trying to balance the mom, it was it's yeah. a lot. It can yeah. be a lot. Yeah. Well, I almost wonder if that's one of the things that feels really good and settled right now is it's, there is no traveling, right? You don't have to travel. Yeah. There, part of me is happy. My Carmen San Diego part wants to go to the beach again. You know, she was like, we can make it to California in like five days. Yeah. Well, do you go to, you know, I'm from Maryland. So do you go to, um, like, do you go to Ocean City or do you go to, what do you do when you, what's your, what's your favorite closest beach? Uh, usually Virginia beach and okay. we go off season. I, like I said, I hate crowds. So we go off season. They have horseback riding on the beach. I can usually get like ocean front room with a beautiful view, um, for a very good price. If you go like in October or March. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So yeah. that's my, my go-to place. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. We would always go, well, I grew up close to the, the bay. So we would obviously the bay, Chesapeake Bay is lots oh, of, yeah boating and all that fun stuff and lots of little beaches but all right Duran it's so good to see your face I love being with you and I'll talk to you soon thanks for hanging out today if you like this episode make sure you subscribe and if you really like this episode share it with a friend and leave a review you can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time. Today's episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.